The Bad Luck Collector Written and read by David Longhorn And this, said Trenton Darbley, is a very special item, a claw of the Himalayan vulture. He took a small wooden box from his French escritoire and opened it. Valerie flinched instinctively, even before she saw the thing inside. It was a huge claw, as big as her hand, or maybe bigger. It consisted of three curved talons attached to a severed limb. The flesh was scaly and black, the talons glossy. She detected a whiff of what might have been some preservative, acrid enough to catch at the back of her throat. That's horrible, she said, covering her nose and mouth with the back of one hand. But rare and valuable, Darblay insisted, closing the box, and allegedly able to bring utter disaster upon anyone foolish enough to touch it, supposedly. All nonsense, of course. He moved over to a glass-fronted cabinet, and Valerie followed him. She had no choice. Darblay was a rich client, and he'd hired her for the night. She'd expected kinks, but being shown his collection of weird objects was still a surprise. A bit boring, but she was getting paid. Now this, Darblay said, sliding a glass panel aside, this is perhaps more in your line. Gold. Valerie felt a pang of resentment at the slight, but the gleam of yellow metal was interesting. There was at least no chance of gold being stinky or dead. She moved up alongside Darblay, wishing she'd not worn three-inch heels. Why did men always lie about their height online? The guy was nearer 5'7 than 5'10. So it's a coin, she said, realising she was expected to say something. Is it valuable? It's a doubloon, the kind of coin you see in pirate movies, the rich man explained. It was supposedly in the possession of a French buccaneer called Guillaume Jemap when he was captured by the English Navy in 1682. They hanged him immediately from the yardarm of his own schooner. Valerie shuddered. The half-hour had seen a steady drip-feed of gruesome stories about long-dead people. She tried to smile and look interested. This was still better than a lot of clients she'd had lately. Hell, compared to the previous guy, Darblay was quite a prize. Smart, successful, generous, and he'd been polite from the moment they'd met up at the bar. Snooty, perhaps, but polite. The silence was growing awkward. She realised she was expected to say something. I suppose they had different ideas about justice back in the olden times, she ventured. Indeed, Darblay said, with a hint of sourness. The point is that just before they strung him up, pirate Jemap is said to have spat on the doubloon and cursed anyone who possessed it, then flung it at the English captain. Valerie leaned closer to scrutinise the old coin. It was badly worn, so much so that the face of some king was blurred and the lettering round the edge was impossible to make out. Why didn't the captain just throw it overboard, she asked. Didn't he believe in curses? Because it's cash money, of course, said Darblay, sounding slightly offended. People didn't throw gold away. You, of all people, should know that. Again, Valerie quelled her annoyance. Silly me. So, did the curse work? Darblay snorted, put the coin back onto its little stand, then closed the glass panel. Of course it didn't. Oh, the captain died of some tropical disease a few months later, but that's hardly remarkable. The coin was passed on to his wife, who remarried and died in childbirth. Her new husband, well, the point is that the coin eventually ended up in a private museum in Liverpool, and I managed to buy it when the museum ran into financial difficulties shortly after. One of my first acquisitions, in fact, by no means as rare as some others, of course, uh, such as... As he talked on, Valerie gazed at the cabinet, taking in the motley collection of objects. A stone idol from Peru, a scarab ring from Egypt, a green glass bottle that had once held some kind of patent medicine. Darblay seemed determined to tell the story behind every single one. Her feet were sore, and she was about to ask him if she could take her shoes off when he paused. Sorry, my dear, I must be boring you. My little obsession is rather silly, considered objectively. She began to protest, but he shook his head sadly. People really don't understand. It's about control and free will. I believe we forge our own destiny in life, and that curses, just like astrology and such, are nonsense. Valerie, who often felt that most of her life's problems were because she was on the cusp of Sagittarius, tried to find something positive to say. So, uh, you keep these as trophies, kind of? The man's face lit up with pleasure and surprise. Trophies, yes, that is the perfect word. I hunt them down and take them, gather them together, so as to prove they have no power over me. 
taunt them, if you like. So, so none of them work? I mean, none of them have any special powers? She persisted. For the first time, Darblay's self-satisfied expression faltered. She felt a small thrill of triumph. She had scored a point. It depends what you mean by work, he said. Some individuals are susceptible to unusual stimuli, a sound, an image. A form of self-hypnosis can come from belief in magical objects, for instance. In one case, a unique example, I had to stop exhibiting an artifact because of its odd influence on some vulnerable individuals. But of course it has no occult powers. That kind of thing has been researched by many experts. Valerie sensed another lecture coming and quickly asked if she could use the bathroom. He directed her along the hall and was totally understanding when she explained about her aching feet. She took off her shoes, placed them next to the door of the library, and stood for a moment, relishing the liberation of her toes. Then she set off down the hallway, past some fancy-looking paintings and little tables dotted with yet more weird bits and bobs. She smiled at a small bronze Buddha, wondering how a curse could possibly be connected with that happy little fat guy. She reached the end of the hall and a small bathroom. When she was done, she did a little maintenance on hair and makeup. Looking good? Well, good enough for him. When she emerged from the bathroom, she noticed that the door to an adjacent room was ajar, just by an inch or so. Valerie knew better than to push it open and be nosy. But as she was walking by, she heard someone speak her name. What made it strange, even a little alarming, was that the mystery voice called her Valerie. That was her real name, not the one she used with friends and family, not the name she used on work nights, not the name she used with men like Darblay. Valerie. It was a familiar voice, a woman's voice, but how would someone she knew be here? Hello, she replied quietly. The voice just kept repeating her name. She wondered if it was someone in trouble. She walked up to the not-quite-closed door, hesitated, then pushed the room was dark, but she saw movement, the silhouette of a figure, slim, feminine, with long hair, framed against pale yellow light. Of course it was her own outline, seen in a full-length mirror. She groped around for a switch, found it. The small room the bare bulb revealed was almost empty. The mirror stood in one corner, slightly angled, but facing the door. There were also a few boxes and a fancy glass lampshade lying on the floor. Evidently this room was unused. The mirror was impressive, a huge oval that was at least five feet by three, mounted on a wooden stand. Valerie, you must listen. Who, who is that? Where are you? She walked into the room, checked behind the door. Nobody was there. Then she looked at the mirror again and gasped. Her reflection was wrong. Her face was bloated, the flesh dark, the eyes bulging, lips pulled back from yellowed teeth. The woman in the mirror was dead. What is this? she whispered, trying to convince herself this was a trick by Darblay, one of his rich guy jokes. This is what he'll do to you, said the other Valerie. This is what will happen. No, she said. The thin, blackened mouth smiled. It was not pleasant. World-weary, cynical, the eyes, clouded with decay, gave an appraising stare. You are always kind of stupid, said the girl in the mirror. You know how dangerous this game is, but you just keep playing it. He's done it to other girls. He buries them in the cellar. You're next. No. The grotesque face faded, was replaced by her own. She stared at her reflection. She tried to tell herself she'd just suffered an hallucination. But she'd been clean for a while now, and had never seen things, well, not things like that. A minute later, Valerie walked back into the study to find Darblay sitting in a splendid armchair, swilling brandy in a balloon glass. A second glass was placed on a small table in front of him. He gestured to it. It's a very fine cognac. I thought you might appreciate it. Or don't you drink on the job? His tone was light, condescending, with no hint of threat. Valerie smiled fixedly and walked over, passing the table and moving behind his chair. You don't want any? Oh, well, Darblay said. I suppose we'd better get down to business. Now, I do have a little room in the cellar. And what I like best... Valerie never found out what Trent and Darblay liked best. She brought the little brass Buddha around from behind her back and swung it straight at the base of his skull. He made a sound, somewhere between a yelp and a sigh. It reminded her of a rubber duck bath toy she'd had as a girl. She focused on that happy memory, 
and others from her childhood, as she crouched over the fallen man and brought the smiling Buddha down onto his head again and again. <laughs>